Okay, so finally, by derivation, by differentiation, we obtain that the, the strains are C minus one times sigma, which is the way that I just found in the strain level model. The dissipation is zero, and the Z's potential is that. So just recall that. In elastic material, the free energy is a quadratic form of the strains in terms of C. The Gibbs function is a quadratic form of the stresses in terms of C minus one. We are going to use that in the future. Okay, depending in what context we are going to work, either in the stress-driven problem, in strain-driven problems, or in the stress-driven problems. So this is for the elastic material. Let's go ahead. In elastic materials. Okay. Now we are, I can recall, we are moving or we are recalling what we did at the, at the beginning. Look, we, we, we just started here in strain driven models, right? What we did in strain driven models. Now we are doing that in stress driven models here. Stress driven models, okay? In elastic material. We define the free variables, the stresses. The stresses. Now what is different? That the internal variable set is not empty anymore. We define some internal variables. For instance, just one, Q. Okay? And then we define the evolution of the internal variable in terms of the free variables and the internal variables itself. Okay? Okay. Then the remaining variables are dependent. So if we look at the strains, the strains would be in that case. Uh, independent vari a dependent variable, so they would depend on sigma and q, and Gibbs potential would depend also on sigma and q. Okay? Okay. By the way, that means that when I need to differentiate g with respect to time, I have to differentiate g with respect to sigma times sigma dot plus g with respect to q times q, q dot. Okay. Now, we define the Gibbs energy as the sum of two terms. One, which is the one that would appear if the material was elastic, the one we have seen, but since the material is not uh, elastic anymore, just we add some additional potential in the Gibbs energy, which depends only on the internal variable. That's the typical form of the Gibbs energy in inelastic materials. And then, what's the next step? We consider dissipation. Dissipation written in the way that we write dissipation for stress-driven materials. So, in terms of the Gibbs energy and sigma dot. This is the alternative form that we have seen for dissipation. And then we wrap that, we replace that equation here. D is equal rho zero G dot, G dot is the to rho zero G with respect to sigma times sigma dot. And then we group that with the term, which is epsilon times sigma dot. So that's here plus this term here, the derivative of g with respect to q times q dot. Again, notice the q dot in terms implicitly through the, through the evolution equation depends on sigma q. So looking at that, the, the question of the dissipation, which has to be greater than zero for any sigma dot, for any evolution of the free variable, that's important here, then we can write it as a function of sigma and q, then multiply sigma dot, plus another function of sigma q. No dot is here. And that has to be greater than zero for a sigma dot. What do we know from the Coleman's method? Let's apply the Coleman's method. Maybe we should go back to the Coleman's theorem that we derived before. Whenever I have a function that multiply x dot being any, plus another function greater than zero, that implies that what multiplies to x dot is equal to zero, and then the remaining is greater than zero. Okay? So let's look, apply that to the situation here, in which we have a function that multiplies sigma dot, that stands for x dot, plus something that doesn't depend, depend on sigma dot. This is a situation. So what can we conclude? That this term has to be zero, and this term is the only one contributing to the dissipation because that term drops. Okay? So finally, we obtain that epsilon is derivative of rho zero g with respect to sigma because this term has to be zero. This is the inverse constitutive equation. 
So what we obtain here is the following. The strains are obtained just by differentiation of the Gibbs energy with respect to the stresses. What happened in the inelastic strain-driven materials? We had something the opposite. I think that should be a, a slide here for this case. I think is that the case. The stresses were derivative of the free energy with, the with respect to strains. Now we have the opposite. The strains are derivative of the Gibbs energy with respect to stresses. So what does that mean? As soon as you have, as you postulate, a Gibbs energy, you have the strains. And you have the inverse constitutive equation. And then what about the dissipation? The dissipation is not zero anymore. The dissipation is what remains in that equation here. That term drops, and dissipation is that. The dissipation then would be the derivative, the derivative of the Gibbs potential with respect to the other variable Q times Q dot. Okay? So this is the, the framework, okay? That's the framework. By the way, if now we take the typical Gibbs potential as a quadratic function of the stresses, that so far we have what would, co would correspond to an elastic material. And now we have an additional potential to define some additional phenomenon that depend on the internal variables. Then, by differentiation of that with respect to the stresses, we obtain epsilon equal c minus 1 to sigma. Okay? Plus, plus, but the dissipation is the rid of, of the, the differential of that with respect to q. So it's the eta it, it prime the limit of eta with respect to q times q dot. Normally, again, this is defined, this derivative is defined as a strain-like internal variable, and it's called alpha. Alpha, which depends on q, and plays the same role that q played in the stress-like uh, defined uh, models that we saw before. So that's it. Well, Let's recover. Look, I'm just re d redoing the, 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 the path that we did for a strain-driven models. Now I'm doing the same in stress-driven models to show you that you can play both games depending on what are you interested in. Okay. So what about decomposing now the stresses before we saw decomposing the strains into the sum, the sum of two strains, the elastic and inelastic part. So now we can consider the same model, same inelastic models, typically plasticity, as the decomposition of the stress in two parts. One is the elastic stress, and the other part or is the inelastic stress. Okay? What is the elastic stress? Well, the word it says exactly what, the is, what, what does it mean? That the elastic stress is the stress that the material would be would have if for the same strain it would be elastic okay so imagine that i have that material at that point of the strain if the material with that strain was elastic what would be the stress that the material ha would have it's just that just the slope with the elastic modulus, that would be the stress that the material would have. That is the meaning of the elastic stress. The physical meaning of the elastic stress is that that stress that the material would have if it was fully elastic. Since it's, it's not, I have to modify that. And how do I modify that? By same inelastic component of the stresses which wouldn't exist if the material was elastic. If this curve just goes straight that way, this part here wouldn't, wouldn't exist. But now, this sigma i, the inelastic stress, is that part that they have to subtract to the elastic stress in order to recover the real stress. Okay? But conceptually, forgetting that maybe, that's something that abstractly it can be regarded as the the composition of the stress into an elastic and inelastic part in an additive form. The only point is this, is this sign, which is minus here, and before it was plus. Okay? Then again, let's play again the same game. The same game. Isothermal case, disregard the thermal uh, effects. And then let's consider 
variable set definition, the free variable are the stresses, because I am in a stress-driven case. The internal variables now is a generalization of the previous case, so to speak. This Q now are split into one set of internal variables, which are the inelastic stresses and some additional internal variables. That is here. That is here. Here. So the internal variables are the inelastic stresses and some additional internal variables. Okay, the dependent variables, all remaining variables are dependent. Depend on what? On the stresses, on the internal stresses as internal variables and these additional uh, internal variables. By the way, as soon as I talk of internal variables, I should provide evolution of questions for that. So the evolution of this sigma, the internal inelastic stress, should be given in terms of the free variables, which are the stresses, the Q variables, and in principle, also in terms of the inelastic stresses. But as before, let's consider that this dependence doesn't take place. So finally, let's consider as a specific case that I don't break the rule, I just specify it, and I say that the evolution equations I'm going to take for the inelastic stresses and the internal variables are ones in which the inelastic stresses do not depend, do, do not, doesn't appear, do not appear. Okay. Again, the remaining variables, epsilon and the Gibbs potential, are dependent variables, dependent of that, of what? Sigma, sigma, y, and q. So whenever I have to look for the evolution of these variables, I have to differentiate epsilon with respect to sigma times sigma dot. Plus epsilon with respect to sigma i times sigma dot i plus the, the derivative of epsilon with respect to q times q dot. And the same for the Gibbs potential. Okay? Now, next step. The Gibbs energy. It's always the same. So again, we see that we postulate the Gibbs energy as the sum of two parts. One, which is the elastic part, which is the one that would appear if the material was fully elastic. What is the shape or the, or the form of the Gibbs potential for an elastic material? We have seen that. For an elastic material, a Gibbs potential turn out, sorry, I'm going back, turn out to be a Gibbs potential, uh, an elastic material, one half of sigma, c minus one sigma. Okay? Okay, so now let's consider that part and see that, sorry, that this uh, potential, sorry, I don't see well here, here. One half of sigma, but what sigma here? The elastic part of the stresses. So these elastic stresses, sigma, c minus one sigma, plus another potential, another potential which depends on the MQ. We postulate this form for this model. Now I replace, I just replace in the dissipation equation, rho zero g dot, giving the, 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 the Gibbs potential minus epsilon sigma dot, I replace, I take derivative whenever I need them, look, this term here, epsilon sigma dot appears here, rho zero g dot with e will be derivative of this with respect to sigma times sigma dot, which is the one appearing here, plus derivative of this with respect to sigma y times sigma y dot which is that one here, but the derivative of sigma y is the same that the derivative with respect to sigma e, plus the derivative of this with respect to q times q dot. Okay? And that can be greater than zero for all sigma dot. Again, now, I realize that this part here, since those are in internal variables, they, their, their evolution equation depends on the on the point values, on the time values, instant values of sigma q and sigma q. So all this term here, at the end of the day, is a function of instantaneous values of sigma, sigma y, and q. Whereas this part of here is the product of a function f that depends on sigma, sigma y, and q times sigma dot. Again, I just find that I can apply the Coleman's method. The Coleman's method that this, if this happens for all sigma dot equals zero, what multiplies sigma dot has to be zero, and the remaining is the expression of the dissipation. And then, after that, and by doing that, I obtain that epsilon, once again, is the derivative of the Gibbs potential with respect to the stresses. That's a common. So, the, the moral of this story is the following. 
in strain-driven models, the stresses are always the derivative of the free energy with respect to the strain. And in stress-driven models, the strains are the derivative of the Gibbs potential with respect to the stresses. This is the general rule. Always, always, always happening this way. You see? And this is a way in which we can now, we will see some examples in, in, a, in some minutes. We can generalize these concepts to more general cases, always doing the same game. So if we want to work in a strain-driven model, I have to postulate the free energy in terms of the strains, differentiate the free, the free energy with respect to the strains, and I will obtain the stresses. Okay? And if I want to work in stress-driven models, I have to postulate the free energy, the, free, the Gibbs energy, this potential. And then, by differentiating with respect to stresses, I will obtain the strength. And that's it. That's, so that's the moral of the full story. So simple as this. A lot of mathematics in SAT, fully rigorous, but the conclusion is very simple. A constitutive model, essentially, is the derivation of a potential with respect to the stresses, if I am working in a stress-driven model, or with respect to the strains, if I am working in a strain-driven model. And that's it. That's it. Okay. And then what remains is the dissipation. The dissipation also is always the product of the strains times the internal variable rates. So the here is the strain times the internal stresses plus this strain-like variable, which is the derivative of that, which is called the conjugate internal variable, times q dot. Okay. So that is something that uh, we are going to keep for the future. So I understand that this is not trivial to follow in all the details. But I think it's quite easy to follow in the essentials. The essentials is what I've said right now. I have, in this framework, which is consistent with the thermodynamics, I, I'm completely free. I can just de derive any constitutive model at my convenience whenever I am fulfilling the rules. And these rules can be expressed in different contexts. I can use the rules in strain-driven models, in which I'm going to control the strains. What, what I have control on is the strains, and I obtain the stresses as a derivative of some function. What function is that, in that case? The free energy with respect to the strains. Or, at my convenience, I can just, if it's, it's my interest, work as the stresses are the, as the free variables, then I can just work in the same context and obtain the strains in terms of the stresses as the derivative of another potential with respect to the stresses. What is this potential? This is potential. Does that mean that the model, the model should be the same in all cases? I mean, the relations of the stresses and the stresses have to be the same. So that means, what is the connection of both models? Well, the potential, the Gibbs potential, is not any. Is the legend transform of the free energy, or the free energy is the Legend transform of the Gibbs potential. Okay, but keeping that rules, I can completely free to derive and to obtain any constitutive model in this framework. That is the message that I want to transmit about that so far. Okay.